Okay, and I am back. We appear to be live. I've changed my setup so that you can see my, my cutting table. And so what I've actually done is, um, in case you can't tell, my desk here, my sewing desk, is actually uh, in a height adjustable. Um, it's an Ikea electric desk. Actually, I might even rise it just a tiny bit more. Whoop, up, not down. Right, because I'm tall, and that means I can cut, I can stand and cut. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and cut this shirt out. And so this is my scrap fabric, the blue fabric. Um, is a very big wide piece. It's super wide. I bought this uh, for quilt backing um, and the idea is you can buy these really large pieces of fabric that um, you can you know do a whole uh, whole back quilt backing without having to cut and um, just lift that up a little more get that up on the is that gonna work? There we go we go. Yeah, so you can get it, uh, you can do a whole quilt backing in one piece. And so it was for a quilt that I had planned and then later decided I wasn't actually going to make. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cut the blue one out here. Um, so I'm going to use uh, my rotary cutter. Um, and I've actually, I've, I've ironed it. And when I ironed it, I've, I've actually ironed it. Um, and using the selvage edge at the top, I've uh, put a fold in it. As you can see, the, the piece was not cut exactly square. Um, I've taken bits off it to use as, uh, for other projects. So it's not a perfectly uh, square cut piece of fabric, but this is my, as I said, this is my test version. This is my, as we call it, um, a toile, um, which is, uh, you know, a, a practice version, you know, a wearable, it'll be, it'll be nice. A muslin is the other name for it. A muslin. Um, if I can get a wearable muslin out of it, so much the better. Um, but I'm not really counting on this necessarily being a wearable one. This is scrap fabric that I'm going to use to test out the pattern and actually check the fit. So let me just grab my rotary cutter and the pattern pieces and get to it. So obviously my front and back pieces need to be cut on the fold. Um, so I'm actually thinking I might reorient my fabric here. Uh, I might try and turn it. Yeah, I'll turn it this way so that I can get it all on the cutting mat. Um, my mom brought me this cutting mat from, mat from the States several years ago. I asked her, I said, can you bring me the biggest cutting mat you can get in your suitcase? And uh, she basically sandwiched it in her suitcase like a taco. Um, but it's, it's pretty big. It's like 24 inches by 36 and I couldn't find any that big in Australia. Okay. So we can put, I'm just sort of doing a little bit of a layout here. So if I do that piece on the fold and then I can do, um, I've got the long ruffle sleeve, which can go down the side there. Um, actually it says grain line the other direction trying to decide that what the best way is to fit all this on. And there is my sleeve. Will the sleeve fit on next to this? Not quite there, will it? Well, I have heaps of fabric here, but maybe what I need to do, I don't want to, you know, waste any of it. Um, so maybe what I can do is I can fold it in a slightly different way so that we don't have quite as much excess. So if I actually fold it, not the entire way across, just part of the way across. And again, I'm using the selvage to line it up because I know that that is straight. So if I line up the selvage there, just make sure I'm not bunching it up. No wrinkles. 
holes, no wrinkles, that's straight. Oh, you can't really see it because I'm a pattern piece. Sorry about that. So if will that fit on there now? Yes, yes, it will just. So basically, I'm just trying to maximize my fabric usage. Like I said, this is, it's a practice garment. It is not going to be super, super perfect. I'm okay with that. Um, but I do want to, you know, don't want to waste fabric. Someone, you know, as, as, as Wobin was saying this morning, one of her family, or his, I think Wobin is a man, um, family friends has a PhD in non-Euclidean pattern making where he explores zero waste design. Like, I don't want to waste any more fabric, you know, than I need to. There's a certain amount of wastage that happens when you're cutting, but. Yeah, I have seen patterns that, you know, use just squares and, and very common shapes and then do folds and things so that you don't waste too much. But look, that's, that's pretty good in terms of getting it on here and, and not, not wasting too much. Hang on, I'll move this other computer because that's blocking the view a little bit. Like multiple computers going and everything. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut this out. Um, I don't actually have any proper pattern weights. So pattern weights are what you use to keep the pattern from shifting. I tend to use whatever I have handy. So I'm gonna use my big clear ruler because that's nice and heavy. I'm gonna use my phone. Guess what, computer mouse. Uh, I have used tuna fish cans in the past. You know, whatever, uh, whatever you got lying around to keep the fabric from shifting. And so this is where it would be interesting if I were doing the projector method that we talked about this morning, if I were projecting the pattern onto the fabric. Um, because, you know, you don't have to worry about the, uh, the fabric shifting around. You're just, oh, hang on, I need to get that fold isn't quite straight. Um, yeah, you don't have to worry about the fabric shifting on you. No pattern weights necessary. But yeah, if you're interested in the uh, learning more about the projectors, sewing with projectors, uh, there's a Facebook group. So if you search for sewing and projectors, you will no doubt find it. Um, they uh, they have a whole they have guides in the Facebook group on like what style of projectors people recommend, um, how you go about editing patterns and 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 um, adapting them if you need to using different software. So if you're interested in going that route, check it out. Um, I'll be honest with you, I eventually left the group just because they were all, it's got quite a vibe of, oh, I'm really hoping my husband gets me one for Christmas, you know, which just buy your own damn projector. But like if, as long as you don't mind like rampant heteronormativity, no, heteronormativity, you'll be fine in there. Okay, time to actually cut this sucker out. So I'm just going to use the rotary cutter. And so the pattern has certain markings on it, you know, for notches and things like that. So I've got my good scissors. So I'm going to just do a little cut for the notches. And this is just, actually, it's, I'll, I'll finish, finish sewing, cutting the dart first. But I'm going to notch where the darts are. And then you also notch things like on the armholes and things so that you can match pieces up when you're sewing it together. So we'll do a notch there for one dart leg. Some people mark them. I do have a uh, carbon paper, so I can show you that for um, marking the bust point on the dart. Um, but there, you know, you can also use, some people use tailor tacks, which is where you sew a bit of thread to do your markings. Um, for, for notches, I tend to just do a little bit of a cut with my scissors, to be honest with you. Okay, shift things around a bit. You can see having, having a, an adjustable height cutting table, if you're a taller person like me, super, super, super handy. Otherwise your back is gonna be killing you. You can also cut on the floor, which is what I used to do in our old place in Sydney. Um, but again, killed my back crawling around on the floor. Okay, then we'll just do this bit around the armhole. So 
So this is the pattern front that I'm cutting, which if you didn't watch the previous morning session, I did a full bust adjustment on. This pattern is the uh, ruffle sleeve top from Peppermint Magazine. Peppermint Mag, it's a free pattern online. It's designed by an Aussie designer in the folds. Um, and so uh, the pattern is designed for a B cup. Um, I measured my diff distance between full bust and high bust and needed to add about an inch and a half, which is where the, um, the full bust adjustment came in. So let's just check for any or other marks we need to do. So I've got some notches to make, so I'll go ahead and make those. Okay, one there. Okay, and I do want to mark the point of my bust dart. Um, and so to do that, I am going to use uh, the carbon paper that I mentioned. So let me just grab that and then I'll walk you through how you use that because it's pretty cool stuff and not everybody um, has it or has used it. So just one second. So this is what it looks like. This is Clover brand um, tracing paper. And it comes, you get a pack and you've got different colors. Now I'm using this blue fabric. We are using uh, the wrong side, which is lighter. I might use like the yellow. I think that might be the easiest to see. I think I've got a piece of yellow in here. Oh, there's white and there's yellow. So I've got this yellow tracing paper. And so actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sandwich it if I can. So I've got my fabric is still folded here. And so I'm gonna sort of sandwich the carbon paper. I think, can I get it up to the dart point? I think I can just get the dart point. So I've sandwiched that fabric, uh, the carbon paper around the fabric, and then you use this special tool, which as you can see has um, little spiky bits on it. And that's what you use to actually, when you roll that, it will make little dotted lines. Now what I've found from, from doing this in the past is that you really need to push against a very hard surface. If I do it on the cutting mat, it's not hard enough. So I'm actually gonna take my ruler and slide that underneath the whole thing because that is fairly hard and that will give me the rigidity that I need. And now I'm gonna use my straight edge just so I don't veer off and make a crazy line. Um, but now I'm just gonna I'm gonna go both directions, I'm gonna make an X. And I'm actually marking both sides of the fabric at the same time when I do this. So I've just marked my bust point, and now if I pull this back and have a look, did I manage to actually catch it? I think, I don't think I can do the sandwich. I don't think it's deep enough to actually quite get in there. Try it one more time. Maybe I need to, if I kind of fold it a little bit, then I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Ah, keep, keep everything lined up. Keep everything lined up. Let me put my phone back on there. We are just on the edge of it, but I think, I think, I think it'll work. Let's try it this time. I think last time I wasn't quite actually on the carbon paper. Let's see if that worked. That looks like it worked. Oh, it's just the yellow's very hard to see. I don't think I can actually see it. Okay, maybe it's the yellow that is the problem. Red, let's try the red. Maybe the red will stand out a bit better against the blue. Otherwise, I do have a pen I could use. I have, um, yeah, I have a, a marking pen, a white marking pen that's good for marking on dark fabrics. Let's try it with the, uh, with the pink, see if the pink works any better. So again, I'm gonna sandwich that. So I'm marking both sides at the same time. 
Yeah, I appear to be on the carbon paper. Oh, third time lucky. Otherwise, I will go to the marking pen. I mean, your mileage may vary. It depends quite a bit on, on how busy your fabric is and how dark it is if you're actually going to be able to see the marks. So I'll mark that X one more time. And this time, yeah, I can kind of see it. It's just that the fabric is quite busy. And so I don't know if you can tell. There, it's, it is on there. It is quite faint. It's hard for you to see, but I can, in fact, see it. Oh, yeah, I can see it better on the back side. Um, there is a, a faint pink dotted line there. So that will be my bus start. And maybe I'll go ahead and just put a pin in it as well so that when I go to sew, I don't lose it. So I will just, my handy chicken pin cushion. I will, um, I'll just put a pin in it as well, just so I don't lose it. Okay, so that's the front cutout. And so we can set that aside. Next will be the back, I think. Or, let me just move all this out of the way. So many bits and pieces. Okay, now for the back. Just go ahead and lop this extra bit off here. Get it out of the way. Um, where's gonna be the best place to do this? I might use the other end, which is narrower already because I've used some of it to do the back. That should be enough to do the back. So if I do that fold, and just get my fabric squared up here. Look, I know people, you go to like really really extreme lengths to get the fabric exactly square. Um, on the Liberty, the, the proper fabric, I will probably go to more of an effort on this given that it is just a muslin. Um, I will, uh, I'm not doing it. Oh, well, when woman says trying to do warping her, his, I think it's a, it's a man, yeah. Woben is, mar is warping Woben's loom on the coffee table and hunched over. So yeah, the, the, the height adjustable table, this is an Ikea desk actually, was, was um, my moving gift to myself when we moved into this place in Munich because I knew that I wanted a cutting table that would go, go higher. Um, just get that. There's a thread, that's what it is. Because this was, I've used this fabric and I've washed it, I've got sort of, it's, it's shredding a little bit along the edge, fraying. A straight fold now. Yes. Selvage is lined up. No, no, massively not lined up. What are you doing? What are you doing? Like I want it, I'm not going to any super efforts, but I do want it to bloody line up. Let gravity be my friend. because it's such a bloody big piece of fabric and it's all bunched up underneath there. Okay. Okay. There we go. There we go. That's better. So yeah, definitely not cut straight. Um, but the selvage is lined up, which we will use as our guide for our grain line. Okay. And then we'll go ahead and sew and cut the back. 
Now, I think this pattern, um, technically, I should be cutting it that way to match what I did at the other end, right? Because the other end, the head was, no, no, actually, we'll go this way. This way is correct. Um, I want to make sure that the pattern, I think this pattern, like the printing, is, is oriented enough that it doesn't matter, like if the front and back, I don't think it's directional, but if you do have a directional print, you want to make sure you're not accidentally cutting the front or back upside down. Um, on this one, because it's an all over print, it doesn't really matter, but I'm just double checking to be sure. And then, I mean, because this is an all over sort of small motif, I don't have to worry about stripes or lining things up. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of finessing you have to do if you're doing a more complicated print. All right, so there's the back out. So let's go ahead and cut that now. So I'll cut the back. Again, so this is on the fold. I've not lengthened or shortened yet. Um, I'm making this blue one as is in the pattern. I suspect it's, you know, based on what it says, it's been drafted for a person who's shorter than me. So I may try and lengthen, um, but it depends. My, my pink Liberty fabric, I have less. <laughs> I have a lot of this blue. I have less of the pink. So I, um, I'm going to be really stretching it on that piece to get it out, to get the garment out. And like I said, I won't bother with the facings. I will use bias binding at the armhole, at the uh, neck neckline. Okay, and now the armhole. really want to loom. Well, Ben, you've got me excited about weaving, but do I need another hobby? I know, I know. Depends how long we're in lockdown, doesn't it? Okay. Okay, so there is the back and notches, 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 lots of notches to make. So again, I'm just going to cut into the seam allowance and just make a little snip for the notches. It's a double notch on the back sleeve. Okay, that is it for the back. The back is a simpler piece. Okay, the back is now cut. So we have a front, we have a back. Next, sleeves. So this has a two part sleeve. Um, there is the actual sleeve cap, and then <laughs> there is a big ruffle. So this piece is actually going to get gathered up, you know, gathered up so that it actually lines up to sew on that piece. And you can see those, eight, those notches, we will actually be using those to, to line it up. And so this is going to be gathered to make a ruffle. How pretty and romantic, right? Um, okay, so I need to cut some sleeves. Luckily, sleeves do not need to be cut on the fold. But I am going to double the fabric because that way I just cut it and I get both sleeves out of it. So I'm going to go back to the other end again and fold along the selvage. Yep. And so now... Now we do this whole dance again of trying to get the fabric lined up. Come on. Come on, gravity, help a girl out. Okay. Not quite, not quite, Chris. So the grain line, for those of you who don't sew, is, is the right angles. You know, fabric, and Wilbur knows this, is woven. Um, you know, the, the warp and the weft are at right angles to each other. And so you really want to get your piece square on the fabric. And so if you've ever bought a shirt or something um, from a, a cheap shop and it twists on you, it's because 
they didn't actually, you know, get, get it lined up according to the grain of the fabric. And it will twist. The fabric will twist and warp as you wear it. And so I want to avoid that, if at all possible. Okay. So I'm actually going to... Now, that's not quite right. Because my fabric, the way I cut out the bodice and uh, the bodice pieces... I need it to be that way. So we're gonna do something else. We're gonna fold it this way. I'm gonna fold it this way and that means I'm gonna have to sort of eyeball the grain. But I said, given this is a waste fabric, I'm not too super worried about it if it is slightly not square. But what I will do is usually if the printing is square, you can kind of use the printing to check if things are lined up properly. Um, so you can actually look along the fold and see if there's a repeat, if it's, if it's actually done just right. And it looks like I'm pretty close to square. Just going by the pattern printing, which again may not be actually square on the fabric, but sometimes that's your only option. And so I've got a repeat here. So those points are the same and that's both on the fold and yeah, that's pretty good. So if I actually do this now, cool. I've now got the same grain line as I did. Actually, I can probably fold it up. Again, trying to not waste too much fabric. How, how deep is my sleeve here? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and again, try and find a common repeat here to make, see if my Fabric is somewhat square. Um, okay, there's that little curly Q bit. Looks like I need to move that piece up a little bit. Yep, yep. Okay. Okay, that looks pretty good. All right, put my sleeve on. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna use, I'm gonna use my clear ruler along the straight edge to actually make sure I've got my grain line. So that's this line drawn on the pattern here. I want that to be at right angles. I want it to be straight. And so um, I'm using my ruler along the edge of the fold. Yep. Yep, and then I can then see through it to actually line the pattern piece up at exactly 90 degrees to the fold. Cool, now we can cut out our sleeves. Let's go ahead and cut these suckers out. As you can see, the rotary cutter makes quick work of this. Quilters use them a lot. That's why my mom, my mom runs a quilt shop. And so she, uh, she's the queen of these. Now any decently sized scraps I do tend to hang on to. They're great for, you know, doing a pocket lining or, um, you know, for, for quilting if you do any patchwork, um, which I do occasionally do some patchwork. So like that's a decent size decent sized piece to get some patchwork out of, so I'll save that. So I do, I do try and save the bigger scraps. But yeah, unless you sew sacks, <laughs> it's really hard to have zero waste with a tailored fitted pattern. Okay, and then this last bit along the slide. Cool. And then we got some notches to cut here. I'm just gonna very carefully turn this around the other direction. Got some notches. So these notches will be so that I can ease the sleeve into the armholes. And 
one side has two notches and one side has one notch, usually the two are on the back piece, so you don't insert your sleeve back to front. The sleeves are slightly asymmetrical. They're not perfectly symmetrical, so you want to watch that if you are doing a set-in sleeve. And I'm just going to do the little notches to help us line up our ruffle. So we got one for the center, and we got one either side. And I did do the center notch as well. Yep, okay, sleeve is cut out. All that's left are these uh, rectangular ruffles. What's Will been telling me about womb looms here? I'm happy to enable the acquisition of new hobbies. Most crafters are, of course. A rigid heddle loom can be quite cheap, and there are some that fold up quite neatly. All right, you're going to have to send me some links, and I will think about it. Um, interestingly, one of the, look, the last trip I made before we went into lockdown was to the um, Wool Museum in Geelong in Australia. And so I've now cut off all the selvage, haven't I? Ha, ha, ha. So I've got no pieces left. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to tear. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll tear because when you tear, you get um, a straight grain line. So I'm just going to go ahead and cut off, cut a little snip. Then I'm going to tear, tear off a bit. And how long does this need to be? Let's sort of eyeball it a bit further. Okay, and then we will, so it tends to tear along the grain line. So you can always use that to sort of square up your fabric. It does stretch it a little bit, so you may need to re-iron it after you tear. But now that I have torn that strip, um, oh great, I just realized that will allow me to cut one, but I will need to do two. So, ha, okay. So that's the side I've just torn. And so I'm just going to go ahead and cut that down to size. You don't even really need a pattern piece for this. It's just, you know, a rectangle. But it does have those notches on it, so. Hang on. My pattern has rotated, hasn't it? No? I don't think this pattern has an up and a down. I don't think it's going to matter. Bugger it, doing it, we're going for it. I guess we'll find out once it's put together if the sleeve ruffle looks like they're at a different angle. But you know what? I don't think you're going to notice at all. A man on a running, on a, <laughs> what's this, the phrase? Like a, some, um, a man on a horse, horseback wouldn't notice it. So not worth, not worth stressing about. I said, I will take a lot more care when I'm using the Liberty. <laughs> but for this, this is the practice one. It's a nice bit of scrap. We'll save that. Okay, so there is, oh, and I need to make some notches on that one as well. Notch, notch, notch. Yep, 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 cool. So that is one sleeve ruffle, and now we need to do one more sleeve ruffle, so I'll tear another bit off of this thing. And actually, I should make sure that the sleeve ruffles at least match the, each other, even if they're the different orientation from the body of the garment. That's the same sort of direction, yes. Okay. Like I said, this is not what you would do for a really lovely special garment, but given this is my my muslin, ooh, ooh. Oh, this one gets narrow. It was not cut on the square. Let's see if we'll be able to squeeze the ruffle out of that. Just, you know what? Just. I'm going to say that that fits 
just, it's just a ruffle. Whew, that was close. So, yeah, that's the straight edge, the bottom edge. So, yeah, we're just getting a little tight on the seam allowance along one side. But it'll be fine. It's just a ruffle. I don't care if the ruffle is slightly skew if as well. Cool, cool, cool. Trim up the bottom edge. And trim up the top edge. And I'm just at the length limit of my headphones. <laughs> okay. Oh, I yanked the laptop a little bit. Um, cool. All right. Uh, oh, notches, notches, notches. Don't forget the notches. Notch. 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 I always miss a notch. No matter what I do, no matter what I'm sewing, I will always miss at least one notch and I have to go back and add it later. Notch. Okay, ruffle's done. You know what, folks? Given that I'm not doing the facings, I think we're just about ready to sew, which means I'm going to have to reorient my setup here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to switch back. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to leave it on. I'm going to turn off the sound and I'm going to get myself oriented. So take five. I'll be right back.
sorry for that. That was quite got kind of messy there, but I think I think I think that layout works. You can you can see what I'm doing. Turn on the sewing machine. Yeah, you can you can pretty much see what I'm doing, right? Cool. Okay, good enough anyway. Um, all right, pattern instructions I have here. Um, all right, so the first thing they suggest is to stay stitched. Oh, thread. I probably want to make sure I've got some some decent thread, huh? How about some more light? Can I put some more light on myself? Uh, is that not plugged? Oh, it's not plugged in. Never mind. How about this one? Can I turn it up any higher? A little bit. A little bit. There we go. There we go. Now you can see me. All right, so stay stitching the neckline on the front. All right, thread. Currently, I am loaded up with some white thread. I think I've got some blue. I'm going to switch to a blue. So this is my new sewing machine, my Janome Skyline S5, and I love it. It's amazing. Uh, this was my, I had, look, my old machine I had for like 20 years, um, literally, but I have passed that on to my friend Lucy, who was sewing up a storm back in Sydney. Um, but now I'm using, oh, I've got this blue, which matches quite well, but I don't have a ton of it left. What else have I got? I think I have some navy blue, don't I? That's a navy blue. Yeah, maybe I'll use the navy blue. I think that's the best match. Um, bobbin, 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 bobbin. Oh, it looks like I've already got some navy blue on a bobbin, so I can use the rest of that up. Um, so this, one of the reasons I bought this particular machine is it has a drop-in bobbin case, um, and it's got a clear lid, so that you can see how much is left on the bobbin which is amazing because I never had that before. I had uh, a front loader where you couldn't see, um, you couldn't really see what was happening. So this one, I can't actually tell when it's, when it's running low, which is nice. Okay, so we'll go ahead and use that up and then I will, uh, uh, have a, wow, I haven't actually wound this in forever. So that goes, comes and it goes under that bit and then it goes around there like that yep cool and then this sucker goes up the top yeah so I sent my machine from Australia and um because I only got it like last Christmas I think and oh gosh I haven't I haven't actually here we go threaded it in a while around that over the arm, back down. Super easy to thread these. This does have a automatic threader thing, which means it's got this stupid little bit that sort of comes down and pokes in your needle. It's not really worth doing. I'll just actually thread it normally. It's fine. Doesn't really save you a lot of time. Put the needle, there we go. All right, threaded, easy peasy. Okay, so first thing we're doing is on the front and back. Oh, no, just on the front, we're stay stitching the neckline and the armholes. So let me just grab the front here. So that was the first thing we cut. So you'll recall, if you watched me this morning, I did a full bust adjustment on the front pattern piece. So if I hold this up, you can, uh, you can see it's a bit of a Franken pattern now, but I added three quarters of an inch. Um, I had a one and a half differential between my full bust measurement and the pattern. So I've, in half, that's three quarters of an inch, which is what I've added there in the middle. And so by stay stitching, what that means is we're actually going to sew, let me get rid of that ruffle. We're going to sew uh, some stitches along the neckline and along the armholes to keep them from getting stretched out. Because when you cut fabric on a curve like that, they can stretch out. And so we don't want it to stretch out. So we're going to do stay stitching. Um, it goes inside the stitch line, so it's hidden. 
Uh, and so we're going to sew about a quarter of an inch in from the raw edge. The pattern specifies. The pattern doesn't specify. You can uh, an eighth or a quarter of an inch is usually usually what you do. And I believe you start at the top and go down to the point. Um, oh, and I've got that pin in there marking my my dark points. So I'll just change that. Okay. So I'm going to start. So there's my. There's my front piece. So I'm going to start at the shoulder line and sew down towards the neck point. And I'm going to do it in two passes rather than one pass because again, this is to keep this is to avoid stretching it out. So I'm going to do a one quarter inch seam allowance. And actually a little bit in a little bit further. And I'm just doing a normal running stitch. And again, we're just trying very carefully to not let this stretch in any way. We're protecting it from stretching. Yay, finally sewing. Did you really think when you're watching the sewing stream that it would be like, you know, hours before you actually sew? That is the reality of sewing. Probably the same with weaving. I mean, I imagine you spend like ages setting up the loom for your next project. Um, knitting, knitting is generally faster to get going. Uh, sewing, like cutting and, and preparing a pattern can take a long time. That's why those, those projector people claim that um, they get going a lot faster. Okay, I'm just gonna go a little past. Okay, and now I'm gonna do the other side of the neck. So you can see, I've just done a little line of stitching along that edge, just to keep it from stretching. I'm just gonna very gently now do the other side. I'm just, oh, I should change, I should update my, uh, my text actually. Current step, sewing. Actually sewing, yay. And so as I get down to the point, I'm just gonna overlap the previous. So again, this, this is not gonna show in any way. It's gonna be hidden in the seam allowance. It's just there right now to stabilize and keep it from stretching out. Oh yeah, Lord yes, warping the loom is fiddly depending on how long or wide the work is. And with a plain weave, the actual weaving can be quite fast. Yeah, exactly. Like um, the, you'll see the sewing, I will spend a lot less of time sewing this garment together than I actually did putting the pattern together and making the adjustments. How are we doing on that bobbin? This bobbin's gonna run out very soon, but maybe we can get our stay stitching done. So now I'm doing the armholes, and again, I'm starting at the top and going down to the armpit. So I'm just sewing along that curve with a one quarter seam allowance and just being very gentle and trying not to stretch the fabric at all. And the idea is this stitching again is gonna be hidden. It's not gonna be seen, but it's just providing some stability. And so now I'll flip over and I'll do that other armhole as well. Ooh, does machine when you get it up to full speed does kind of jostle the <laughs> desk a little bit. So I did lower the desk, so it's down, and I'm not sure it's at the right height yet. Yeah, you, know, you don't want to hurt your hurt your back. Um, yeah, with a more complicated weave, it bent my brain a bit keeping up with the row I was on in the company. Yes, I imagine, I imagine so. There are. I mean, I, I've seen weavers, you know, weaving at Stitch and Bitches and stuff like that. So it is portable. Um, sewing, for the most part, garment sewing is not portable. You, you really kind of have to do it at home in a workshoppy kind of environment. But, uh, you know, knitting you can take with you, um, which is nice to have a project that you can do on the go. Okay, so we've done with step one. What's the stay stitching? Complete. 
Step two is to actually sew the dart. So that is where we have our points marked. We used the, um, the very faint pink, I can see it. And so what I'm gonna do, so the dart, if I hold up the, so this is the bodice piece and you can see the armhole there. You see there's kind of a triangle off the side. That excess fabric is part of our dart. And so that's gonna be actually taken up. So I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and uh, mark that point of that dart. Let me move my machine back a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm gonna find that point of the dart and there it is. I can just see that pink, pink, fab, pink uh, mark we made with the carbon paper. So that's the point of the dart. And then I'm gonna fold, and I've got the notches in the dart as well so I can know where I'm folding it. So I'm gonna bring the legs of the dart together And so what does she say? Fold each dart, right sides together, match the notches and folding towards um, the, the point that you made. Um, pin in place. Pin from the notches to, oh, okay. So she had you mark, use an awl to mark a hole um, for where the point is. Um, I, I don't do that, I, I, I just mark the actual point. But if you did that, um, you can draw in the stitch line with a ruler and erasable fabric pen. Yeah, no, that's fine. I don't need to do that. Okay, so, so there's my point. Make sure I've got it folded. Yep, and then that's the dart legs are there. I'm just gonna put, put a pin. I mean, I could draw it on. I, I, maybe I will. Maybe I will draw it on just so you can see what that looks like. Let me grab. Uh, that white pencil that I've got that I mentioned before. I've got my box of sewing supplies here. I really need to find a way of organizing it now that we're settled and moved in. Everything's just kind of in a jumble. There it is. So I've got this funky white pen, which is like a chalk pen, I guess. Uh, so tasty, it says, whatever. Okay. Um, and I'll get a straight edge. I have one of these triangles. And I'm just gonna draw from the point to the dart line, just so I've got a line to sew, because it is, you know, it is a long line. And that will, that means I know exactly what line I'm sewing along. Okay, and then I can put a pin or two along that line as well. So we use darts to create three-dimensional shapes because you're taking a two-dimensional piece of fabric and you're sewing it to fit a human body, which is three-dimensional. And so a dart is where you're folding out some of the material and it's gonna create, in this case, room for the bust. So I've pinned one side. Um, I'll go ahead and do both so that I can... Oh, hang on, hang on, that fold was not quite right, you know? Look at that. Um, Let's just make sure I wasn't quite exactly on the fold. That's better. Okay. Let me just redraw my line and make sure my line is still straight and my line is still correct. Yeah, it wasn't, it was slightly off. Cool. I'm gonna make sure you don't wanna have one, one bust line in a different position than the other. Okay, and now I'll do the other side. I mean, actually, truth be told, um, human breasts aren't, aren't, aren't rarely symmetrical, but I've not seen any sewing patterns that actually take that into account. You always assume a bust is symmetrical. Um, Maybe I'm, that's, that's a discussion for another day, I guess. <laughs> Whether you wanna make a asymmetrical bust garment. Be an interesting um, customization for free sewing given that you, know, you can customize and it generates the pattern on the fly. I should suggest that to Juiced, he's the organizer. Okay, so that's where my dart 
matches up at the edge. Yeah, notch, notch, and then just make sure the fold is nice and flat. There we go, there we go. And then I'll draw in the line, the sewing line for this dart. So you sew a dart by starting at the outside seam line, the side seam line, and you sew down towards the point. And so that is what I'm gonna do. Yeah, perhaps at least to appear symmetrical. Yeah, I guess so, I guess, well, then that's the, you know. <laughs> if you sewed them asymmetrical, you're right, it would be more obvious they were asymmetrical. All right, uh, do I need to wind a bobbin yet? Let's, nah, let's go ahead and just we'll apply thread chicken and see if we can um, sew a dart. All right, so sewing the dart. So again, I've pinned it. So I'm gonna start from the side seam and sew down to the point. And as I get close to the point, I'm actually gonna shorten my stitch length. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start off and I am gonna lock these stitches, so I'm gonna, you know, um, reverse a few. Where's my chicken? There's my chicken. All right, so I'm gonna take a few stitches. One, two, three, four. Let's reverse a little bit. One, two, three, four, okay. And I'm just sewing along that line that I marked down towards the point. Please don't let me run out of bobbin. Okay, now I'm about an inch from the point. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start shortening my stitch length. So depending on how your machine, you might have a knob, you might have mine's digital. So I'm just gonna shorten it down a little bit. So the stitches are getting smaller the closer we get to the point. So I made them a little bit smaller. So a little bit more. Yep. And then I'm gonna shorten them even more. And basically you wanna end right on the point where you, that you marked or where your pin was or whatever. And you wanna just sew, you know, again, just getting tinier and tinier stitches as we get closer to the point. And I'm just gonna stop right there. I'm not gonna cut my threads. I'm gonna lift the, the needle up. I'm gonna pull, yay, I didn't run out of bobbin. I'm gonna pull and leave, um, leave a long tails. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna tie those in a square knot. The, the two threads. So you don't reverse at the tip of a dart. You instead shorten your stitches down, shorten, 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 and then leave long tails, cut a uh, tie square knot, and then leave, um, and then you can trim it off at about a centimeter. That's, that's how you do a dart. So that's one side. So we've sewn one dart. Um, and so now we'll go ahead and do the other side. And again, we start from the side seam. And ooh, how's my bobbin looking? Oh yeah, we're good, we're good. Cool. Uh, put my stitch length back up to normal, which is a 2.4 on this machine. And we just repeat the process. Uh-oh, hang on, thread. Thread came out of the needle. That's not gonna work. Let's, let's get that back into the needle. There we go, okay. All right, sewing the dart. Needle in, sew a couple stitches, reverse a couple stitches. Okay, don't sew over the pins, that's very bad. Don't put pins in your mouth. That's also very bad. Okay, again, as we're getting about an inch away, I'm gonna start shortening my stitch length. Just as we get closer to the tip. A little bit more. So I'm down, so I went from a 2.4 to a two, now I'm at a 1.5. And then just the last three or four stitches to the tip, I'm actually gonna go down to a 1.0. So it's just a tiny, tiny stitch and you're just going right up to that point and then catching that very last thread and then again, lift the needle, leave a bit of a tail and tie them in a square knot and trim them off. 
So we've now got two darts and I'm fairly certain the next step is going to be to iron them. That's something people probably don't, non-sewers probably don't understand is you do a lot of ironing as part of sewing, not just for prepping your fabric, but pretty much every time you sew a seam, you are then going to iron it, which sort of sets it, sets it in place. It also makes it easier to sew subsequent pieces together. Um, I'm trimming, I trim, I'm a trimmer. I trim my thread ends as I go. So fortunately for me, I have my iron right behind me. Um, so I'm going to turn it on and you might not be able to see what I'm doing. Let me just see what the pattern says the next step is. Uh, yeah, she doesn't actually tell you to do it, but of course you should do it. So I'm going to do it. Hey, if I turn the camera, you might be able to see the iron. I just a little bit more. There we go. So I can just iron right here, just turn my chair. So that's the dart that we've just sewn. And so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to just actually iron it up to the point, the way that to set the stitches. And then I believe you always fold the darts down, don't you? Um, yeah, the dart, I believe you iron so that the dart goes down to the bottom. So then I'm going to fold the dart and iron it down. Yes, that's right. And this is, you know, we've now made a three dimensional shape, so it gets a little bit more. You can use, and I do have a tailor's ham, which is this sort of um, round lumpy thing you can use to iron on. But so there, uh, there we go. So there is a, a dart that has been ironed down. Hang on. Uh, so now I'll do the other side as well. So again, first I'll iron it on the back side to iron in, sort of set the stitches, set the fold. Okay, and now I'm going to open it up and fold it down towards the waistline, away from the neckline. And hey, it lines up, which means our full bust adjustment looks like we didn't get anything wrong with the extending the dart legs. Yay! Okay, so we've now prepped the front. And so if I hold it up, turn the camera a bit this way. I hold it up now. You should be able to see that we've got, we've created some shape for the bust. Um, we've actually got some shape happening for the bust line. All right, so that's the front. So set that aside. Now the back, we have to do stay stitching on the back as well. So I've got the back piece here and I'll go ahead and turn the camera back to the sewing machine. All right. So stay stitching again. So here's the back. And so we're going to do the neckline. So that's the back neck. And again, I'm going to do it in two passes. I'm not just going to do one whole curve. I'm going to go from the uh, shoulder into the center and then do the other side the same direction and that is again to counteract any sort of potential stretching or rippling we really don't want that to happen on our curved bits so stitch length is back up to normal 2.4 and I am again doing stay stitching at about a quarter of an inch in from the edge of the fabric just because it's going to be hidden this stitching is not going to be seen. It is just to stabilize and keep, keep the curved bits where you've cut the fabric, any curves. Okay, so I've hit the center line. So I'm just going to go a couple stitches patch to the center. Stop. Okay. And now we'll turn around and go the other direction. So going from the other shoulder, repeat the process. And there's a couple, the, the, the sort of little curve on the shoulders such that I'm actually moving the fabric under the, fa the foot a little bit. Okay, and then I get back to the center. I'm just going to overlap the previous stitching a little bit and cut it. So that is our neckline stay stitching done. And now I'm going to do the sleeves. And again, I'm going to start at the shoulder. So that's the shoulder at the top there. And I'm going to sew down the sleeve, the arm side. 
So for those of you who are just joining us, someone has just joined us. We are, I am working on the ruffle sleeve top, which is uh, by an Aussie designer called In the Folds. It is a free pattern available on Peppermint Magazine. If you search for Peppermint Mag, and then there's a menu option for sewing patterns. Um, it's, I think it's on the first page of results, but just keep scrolling back until you find it. I think you have to give them your email address in order to download, but. And so I'm stay stitching the armholes and the neckline, which is a preparatory step, preparation step to keep the curved bits from stretching out. And okay, there's one armhole and now other armhole. And I reckon after this, we we'll probably need to wind the bobbin because if I'm not at the end of it, I'm gonna be very close. So, playing thread chicken here. And again, this is very close to the edge. I'm doing a quarter inch, just to, it's gonna be hidden in the seam allowance. Okay, we did manage to get all the stay stitching done. Woohoo! Nice. Okay, the next step is to actually sew the shoulder seams together. Do I have enough on this bobbin? Do I have enough? It's really, uh, it looks like we're good to go. I'm gonna keep risking it. At some point, my luck will run out. All right, so I've got my front and my back. I'm gonna put them right sides together and sew the shoulder seams. Um, and these are gonna be uh, half an inch seam allowance. So that's, um, yeah, 1.2 centimeters, half an inch. So I'm just gonna line them up here at the shoulders. And I will put some pins. And again, I think on a shoulder seam, because you know, I don't think, look, it, it's, it's not a great deal of difference, but I believe there is an order and a direction for sewing. And in general, it's always sort of from the top down. So I'm gonna be starting from the neck hole edge and then sewing outwards towards the shoulder. I believe that's correct, but please someone in the comments correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that is the, uh, the correct direction. Um, patterns don't always specify that, but I've, I've read some books and look, I don't think it's gonna make a huge amount of difference if, if if you sew your three inch seam the other direction, but might as well try and try and do things properly if we can. Okay, so those shoulder seams are now pinned, um, right sides together. So I'm gonna sew that, as I said, from the neck opening to the sleeve opening. So sewing that seam, um, one half inch, is our, make sure I know where that line is on my machine, one half inch seam allowance. And this is where you need to, on a given pattern, by the way, you probably wanna look and see what the designer uses for their seam allowance, because different designers use different seam allowances. Um, I know the Colette ones often use 5 eighths of an inch. Um, this, this particular one is using uh, half an inch, 1.2 centimeters, so just make sure you know. Sometimes it's marked in the pattern, on this one that it pretty much is, but sometimes it isn't, it isn't, on the, it isn't printed. So you, you, wanna, you wanna make sure you're, cause it will affect the size of your garment. And look, you can adjust it. It's often a trick if you've sewn something and it's just, just slightly too big or too, um, too big, you can actually, or too small, you can actually use the seam allowance. So you could re unpick the seams and re-sew them with a slightly bigger or slightly smaller seam allowance. It's usually a last resort <laughs> to get something to just right. But, all right, so I'm sewing this seam half an inch. I'm gonna do the reversing at the edges to lock the stitches. And there's my half inch mark. I'm just sewing the shoulder seams. Don't sew over pins, that's bad. They will break. Break your sewing needle. Break and go in your eye. We're not doing that. And then I reverse a bit at the other end. And then I love the fact this machine just has a button. Boop, and it, 
it pulls both threads to the bottom and cuts them off. Um, and I, I absolutely love it. So uh, as I said, I'm just going to trim up. I've still got my long threads from the stay stitching as well. So I'm uh, some people don't trim constantly as they sew. I am a, a thread trimmer. I like to keep my scissors nearby. And then the other side, again, we're going to go from the neck edge down to the shoulder. See, look at those long, look at these long threads. Ugh, I'm just going to get tangled up. Let's just cut them off. Cut them off, people. All right, again, half an inch is what this in the folds the designer has recommended for the seam allowance. And needle down. I'll take a couple stitches, reverse a bit, and then you should be taking bets on when I have to unpick because I never sew anything without sewing something on backwards and having to unpick it is bound to happen, especially because I'm distracted by talking to you people. Okay. Shoulder seams are done. And I'm pretty sure we will now be ironing them. Hi, Modite, Modite, however you, Mod Light. I can't quite read. Mod, Mod Light, nice to meet you. Mod Light, Merry Christmas to you. Um, okay, it says to press the seam allowances open. Oh, interesting. Okay. As the shoulder seams will be enclosed inside the facing, the instructions guide you to sew the seam in the standard way. If you chose to omit the facing, bias binding, which remember is actually what I'm planning on doing, you could show the shoulder sh sh sew the shoulder seam with a French seam. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not doing that on this one, but I will do that um, when I sew the one with my Liberty fabric. So a French seam is a way of enclosing uh, the edges of the seam. So we haven't actually finished. I could do that now. I can finish them. You know what I will? I will do it. I'll finish them now with a zigzag stitch. So basically this shoulder seam here that we've sewn, we're going to iron it open, but these raw edges are going to be inside the garment and so they can fray. And so if I had an overlocker, I could overlock those edges, but on this machine, I'm just going to use a zigzag stitch. So I'm just going to open it up and my zigzag stitch on this one is 11. So I'm just going to switch to a zigzag stitch and I can actually just zigzag along the raw edge. And so I'm going to fold back the seam allowance. So I'm only sewing one side of the seam allowance. Um, and so what the pattern is saying is there's another way of sewing uh, where you enclose, you sort of fold and enclose the raw edges. It's called a French seam. Um, it's often what you see on, a, on like a men's dress shirt, you know, on like the sleeve seams and the side seams. So I will be doing that. I will do that on the, um, on the proper, the other shirt that I'm sewing. This is my practice one. And so for this one, I am just going to zigzag on the raw edge. Uh, it's, it's, it's not quite as nice a finish on the inside. It's definitely, so this is my practice version. So I don't care so much. I'm going to zigzag one and a half. Yeah, maybe I'll go a little. One and a half. Okay, and then I'm just gonna zigzag along the edge of that raw edge. And the idea is it will keep that edge from unraveling. And so I've just now got, if I can show you there, you probably can't see it because of the light. But yeah, I'm just going to do that on all four edges of the, uh, of the shoulder seam. It's kind of fun that they put the asterisk there after the step. Maybe this is a lesson to you to not do as I do and to actually read, read the instructions before you start sewing the thing. See, this is, I told you, I'm going to end up unpicking something. I 100% will. Trim up my ends as I go. But that's, this is why I'm glad I did the practice one because now I know that and now on my, on my pink version, I will do the French seams. And so now I'm just gonna do the other side. Ooh, it's bouncing.
Okay, so there's that one done. And now the other shoulder. I still can't believe this bobbin hasn't run out yet. It's a Christmas miracle. I guess this isn't the nicest finish, the zigzag edge. It's often what you'd find in, you know, if you find an old homemade garment, you will probably see this along the edges, just using some zigzagging to finish. An overlocker, which is a separate machine, is uh, much more professional. It's, it's what creates that sort of professional seam finish. If you look inside uh, like a garment um, or, you know, inside your jeans seams, you will often see overlocking. Um, and so I have an overlocker back in Australia. I didn't bother to bring it to Germany with me, um, but it is a useful thing to have. If you are doing a lot of garment sewing, it will make your garments look quite a bit more professional. Okay, so I've done all four of those. Um, and so now I can go ahead and iron it. As I said, we iron constantly when we're sewing. Just trim up some of these thread ends. Turn the iron back on. And so I'm actually going to be pin open, so ironing these open. So I'm going to sort of drape it over the end of the sewing board. So that's the armhole there. And I'm actually going to press that seam open. So rather than to the front or to the back, it's, it's open. Okay, and so that's going to set our stitches really nicely. And now I'll turn around and do the other direction. I do miss my overlocker. There also, you really need an, 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 where an overlocker really shines. So it's for finishing the edges of woven fabric, sure, but also um, for sewing knits. It's great for sewing knitted fabric to like a sweatshirt or a t-shirt, because um, if you look inside your t-shirt, it's all sewn with an overlocker. So that's what an overlocker looks like. Okay, so there's those. So as you can see, let me turn this. I have, I have uh, opened that seam up and, and ironed it that way. Cool, all right, yes, there is a Christmas elf feeding more thread inside the machine, 100%. Okay, so press those uh, seam allowances open and now we're gonna sew the side seams together. Um, and this says, oh, interesting, different, different seam allowance. She says to use a quarter inch seam allowance along, along the sides. All right, I'm not sure why we're doing a different seam allowance, but I'm gonna trust the designer. So, sure, okay, pin the sides together. Um, I'm gonna make sure when I pin the side together that then my darks, remember that flappy bit, that's the dart? I'm gonna make sure that's pointed down. And the direction of sewing on this is I'm gonna sew from the armpit down the side seam. So I'm just gonna put some pins in that. I don't think there are any, no, there's no real notches along that. You just sort of match it up. Sometimes side seams, especially a long side seam, will have, will have some notches just to help you make sure things are lined up, but these are the same length which is good, it means I didn't bugger up the full bust, bust adjustment. And so, I'm just gonna go ahead and pin that. This is coming together very quickly. So it's, a, it's actually, I mean, we haven't gotten to the ruffle yet. <laughs> that ruffle's gonna be fun. We've gotta set in sleeves and we've gotta sew a ruffle onto them. So uh, that's gonna be fun. That's why I wanted to do a practice one, cause have I sewn a ruffle? I'm not a ruffle type of person really. So um, I, I don't know that I have actually sewn a ruffle yet. This is, this, is for, oh, this is a first, you are seeing it here first. Okay, 
So I'm pinning the other side seam. And so far everything is lining up and, and it looks like the bust adjustment has, I, I didn't get anything wrong. Everything's lining up right, which is always good. So stitch with half inch wide seam allowance. Press seam allowance to one side before trimming down by about half. Oh, that's because we're doing French seams. Ah, I'm pinning it wrong. Ha, huh. good thing I'm actually reading the instructions. We are doing French seams along the side. So, good catch. Woo, see, I would have had to unpick that. I would have had to unpick that. So I'm undoing these seams. So to do a French seam, what we're gonna do is, we're, it's counterintuitive. We're actually gonna pin it together with the wrong sides together. And we're gonna, that's why we're using a quarter, ah, now it all makes sense, okay. So we're gonna do it, um, we're gonna sew it with a quarter inch seam allowance on the right side of the garment. And then we're gonna then turn it around the other direction and sew another seam enclosing that inside. Got it, that's a, actually, it's a really professional finish. It's a really nice way of doing it. So I'm gonna flip my, <laughs> flip my shirt around the other way. So I'm gonna do it right sides together. Always read the instructions, kids. Whew, that was a lucky catch. Yes, we're doing it live. <laughs> this is happening. Here we go. You're experiencing the ups and downs of garment sewing with me in real time. Okay, pinning, pinning my side seams again. And we're gonna do a French seam. Oh, I'm excited. I have done these on a few men's shirts that I've made for the snook, but I'm not, I don't think I've actually done them on anything for me, so nice. Excellent, okay. Um, and then the other side. So yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Like I said, this pattern is a free pattern. If you wanna look it up, look up Ruffle sleeve, ruffle sleeve top by In The Folds. Uh, Australian designer, free pattern. It just pulls over the head so there's no buttons or enclosures of any type, which is nice. It makes it a lot faster to sew, not having to put in any sort of closures. And it's got French seams, which is a lovely feature. And if I had been paying attention, I would have known ahead of time. Um, Cool, cool, cool. All right, so I'm gonna sew those with a quarter inch seam because it's a French seam and that's what we're doing. Got it, cool. Quarter inch seam, which on mine is that line on the foot right there. And we're not doing zigzag stitch anymore. Ha ha, nearly caught it. We're back to just doing a normal stitch. What am I doing? Yeah, one, there we go. Okay. I actually haven't used this machine that much. Like I said, I only got it um, last year around Christmas time. And, you know, I sewed some stuff in the first half of the year. Uh, I, was, I had a lot of friends having babies. And so I made a, several hug books, which is a, a soft quilted, um, you buy these panels that you sew for babies. It's like a little pillow book. And so I made a few for, for friends' kids. I um, can't remember if I actually made any garments on this thing yet. And then, and then it went on the boat to go to Germany. And so I didn't have it for the last few months. So this is, this is the first garment I've made with it, I think. Okay, I'm down to the bottom. I'll reverse a little bit. Okay, and... Man, that bobbin is still going, folks. Okay, and now the other side. 
Again, I'm going from the armpit down to the waistline. And I am sewing the side seams with a quarter inch seam because we're gonna do some magic here in the moment and make a French seam. Oh, hang on. It's uh, bunched up a bit, that one. Let's fix that, let's fix that. When I reversed, it sort of bunched up on itself a little bit. I was too close to the edge. Ah, it's doing it again. That's gonna use up the bobbin, isn't it? Just see if I can un... It's fine, it's just the bit that's actually gonna be in the seam allowance, so it's, it's not a problem. It's just bunched up a bit there at the end. Why it keeps doing it. There we go. Just get past that point. Reverse a little bit, and then there we go. So someone else has joined watching the stream. So I'm making a top for myself. This is, I'm using some, some quilting cotton, to be honest with you. Normally quilting cotton is not... You know, people, I think, often when they're starting out sewing, you get entranced by the prints in the quilting section. Um, but quilts, Patrick quilts, are, are it's slightly thicker, to be honest with you, than what you normally make garments out of. You know, the other place I've found interesting prints that isn't necessarily the best choice for garments is Ikea. Ikea have fabric in, you know, the upholstery department. And they often do these really cute Scandinavian prints, but they tend to be a bit thick for sewing garments out of. Um, I have made some skirts out of them, but I think for a top it would be. So, so this is gonna be maybe a little bit slightly stiffer, definitely than the other fabric I've got, than the Liberty, but we're doing it, um, we're gonna go with it. All right, so French seam. What she says to do is press the seam allowance to one side before trimming it down by about half to just a couple of millimeters. So back to the iron, which is still on, and I am gonna, pr I am gonna iron these towards the back. Let's do that. So I'm gonna put it on, and so that's, that's the front. Yes, so I'm gonna iron it, folding it towards the back. So I'm just gonna fold that seam line towards the back side. running out of headphone cable. The things I do for you people. Okay, ironing towards the back and then I'll do the other side seam. And again, let's be symmetrical, I'll iron it towards the back. So ironing is, is setting the stitches, it's making the fabric lay nice and flat. Basically, every time you finish sewing a bit, you wanna turn around and iron, which is why it's great. I've got this setup here where I have my ironing board. I can just literally turn around and, uh, and, and do the ironing with each seam as I go. So, okay, now we are ready to actually uh, trim these up. So you'll recall it said, so we've ironed those seams towards the back. So there's one of them there. And so I actually wanna trim that seam allowance down even closer to just a couple millimeters. So I'm gonna use my scissors and very carefully cut, not cut into the garment itself, just cutting into the seam allowance. I'm just gonna cut it down even shorter because we're gonna be enclosing it in the seam itself. And so I'm just cutting off a tiny strip to make that seam allowance even shorter because we're going to be encasing it fully. I'm just going to take my time. So the bit where the dart was, I'm actually cutting through some extra layers there. And so I'm just taking, 
taking the seam allowance down by about half. And this is so we can do a French seam on this side seam, which is gonna be a really nice professional finish. And all the raw edges will be encased so I don't have to do that trick like I did on the shoulders. Okay, so there's one side done. Flip over and do the other side. Just trimming down the seam allowance. And I'll keep the stream open. So again, if you have questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Honestly, I'm surprised anybody Anybody tuned in? I, you know what? It's because I'm going a little get cabin fever. I don't get out to talk to anyone because we're under lockdown. All non-essential shops are closed. Well, and plus it's Christmas Eve, which means everything here is shutting for the next few days anyway. So this is all I have to do. There is an 80% chance of snow tomorrow for Christmas, which I'm very excited about. Okay, cool. Have trimmed down the seam allowance on both sides. Next step is uh, turn it inside out. So now we're going to do, yep, turn it back inside out so the wrong side is showing. We're going to Press the side seams flat. So that's my side seam. So let's go back to the iron. And we're actually gonna fold it over because this time we're gonna sew the side seam again, but we're gonna catch. We're gonna actually sew it so that, that those raw edges are inside the seam. I'm just ironing it flat now. So a French seam, I mean, it does take longer because you are sewing two seams instead of one. But it's gonna look so good. Okay, so there's one side flat and now the other side. Maybe I'll make less mistakes because you guys are watching, because I'm actually talking through my process as I go, as opposed to just blasting through it while I'm listening to music or a podcast like I normally would be. Okay, folding that side seam down and ironing it, cool. And so now I'm gonna sew that again, again with another quarter. So that's how we get our half inch. We did a quarter inch the first time and trimmed it down, and now we're doing another quarter of an inch. So together that gives us a half inch seam allowance on the sides, which makes sense. Um, but so you can see, so that's where I folded it. And so now, maybe I'll just put a couple of pins along that side, along that edge. to keep it from shifting while I'm sewing it. And we're gonna go ahead and sew a half an inch, or sorry, another quarter, quarter, quarter. See what I nearly did? Quarter, because I'm saying it. One quarter inch along this. Okay, back up a little bit. Okay, and then down the garment. And so the raw edges are fully encased. It's gonna look so nice.
can actually adjust the maximum speed on this thing so it doesn't quite rattle so much. Reverse a bit. Cool. Okay. Now we have a French seam fully enclosed. And so um, when I iron that, you're just gonna have this beautiful folded bit on the inside. You're not gonna see any raw edges. So good. Okay, let's do the other side. Turn it around. quarter inch seam on the other side. And I really will wind the bobbin after this because no way am I going to attempt to sit in a sleeve and potentially run out of bobbin in the middle of that or sewing a giant ass ruffle okay oh wow I cannot believe we made it how much is on that bobbin holy crap that literally is empty we got to just to the end of that seam I cannot believe that that's amazing Woo! perfect timing all right so um, the next step would be to attach the facing. And so since I'm not going to use facing, this is actually where I'm going to use uh, bias binding instead. So, yep. Um, so this is all putting the facing in. I'm not doing a facing. So we will go ahead and do bias binding. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind a bobbin. So I'll go ahead and do that. So to wind this bobbin, I need to pull my thread because you wind it in a slightly different way for winding the bobbin. Go around this direction. Yep. Through that guide. Yep. And then I haven't done this in a while. I don't remember how to do it. Poke it through the hole in the bobbin. Put it on the thing. Oh, that's a, push it over. And that puts it, yep, that puts it into bobbin mode. Cool, cool, cool. And then I just go, right? I just hit the thing. Yeah, beautiful. Winding the bobbin. Uh-oh, thread busted. Damn it. I'm like, what happened? The actual thread broke. So weird. Let's try again. Must have had a weak spot on the thread. Or it was where I was holding it. Oh, that's, that's, that's not, that's a cutter, dumbass. That's not where it goes. Yeah, that would be my fault. That's because I actually, <laughs> I wound the thread into the thread cutter. Brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. That'll be why it broke. Now let's try again. That's better. Winding a bobbin.
and it has an automatic stop. So as the bobbin gets full, oh, except mine just got a bit tangled, so I will call it there. Yeah, got a little bit, got a little bit wonky at the end. Why did you do that? There we go. It's because of that long tail I had when I started. Just pull a bit off and even it up. Okay. We have a bobbin. And it is time to make some bias binding. I don't have, you know, you can buy bias binding. Um, so bias binding is a strip, uh, a narrow strip of fabric uh, cut on the bias, which means it's cut at a 45 degree angle to the grain of the fabric. And what that does is it means it, it goes around curves, um, which is what you want when you're sewing around a neckline, like I'm going to be using it for to finish that edge. And so you can't just cut a plain square strip of fabric. It won't, it won't bend nicely around the curves of your garment. So you can, like I said, you can buy packs of bias binding in the store, buy the meter, or you can make your own, which is a lot more fun and which I enjoy doing. So that's what I'm gonna do as soon as I thread this damn needle. There we go. Okay, we got a needle, we got a bobbin. We're good to go. All right, all right, but before I use the sewing machine, I need to get a square piece of fabric. I'm gonna just update the status here. Current step, making bias binding. All right, so to make bias binding, the first thing we need is we need a, a perfectly square, squared off bit of fabric. So, clear off a bit of room here. So I'm gonna get some more of my blue, blue fabric. And you don't need a very big piece to make bias binding. Actually, hang on, let me make sure, I might've already made some of them. Let me just go check my trims box and see if I've already made some with this fabric. No, no, I have not. So I will be making my bias binding. All right, so let me find a suitable bit. I want where I can get sort of a square, square piece of fabric. You know what? I might just sort of tear this bit. Okay. And by square, I mean at right angles. I don't mean it literally has to be a square. It can be a rectangle. Um, so that's that edge that I just tore, that one there along the, that edge. Um, so I will go ahead and tear again. Actually, I'll go a little bit further in so I get a nice maximal square, okay? And so I know that this edge and this edge are square. I'm just gonna quickly iron it because when I tore it, it does sort of ruffle it a bit. So I'm just gonna give it a bit of a press to make that edge square. Okay. So if I lay it down, this is where my, um, this is where my, my cutting mat really is very handy. So yeah, so I know that that bottom edge and the side is, is square. Let me just give it a bit of a stretch to square it up. I know that those two are at 90 degrees to each other. So I can use the lines on the cutting mat to, to even it up. Right, cool. All right, well, it looks like I've got a piece that is 20, 
24 inches long by 10 inches wide. And so I'm just going to square that up using my rotary cutter. Um, this is going to be a slightly inexact science, but that's okay. Rotary cutter and big clear ruler. And I can actually use, this is where you can use the lines. Um, yeah, actually I go that way. So I want to make sure that the piece that I'm cutting is going to be 24 by 10 square. And so I can use the lines on the thing to actually line it up. Move it in a little bit more. That's easier. Move it in an inch. So because I'm making, I'm, I'm obviously making it out of the same fabric, it will match. Your bias binding doesn't have to be the same fabric. You can make it out of something else, but I always think it looks cooler if it's, if it's the same. All right, and I'm just gonna square that up. Okay, and then, And the end, make sure the ends are nice and square as well. I've got the two long edges parallel. And I mean, you don't like, there's no exact size here. Um, so I'm actually gonna lose, I'll, I'll cut off the ends so I make sure they're nice and square. Just needs to be a rectangle. Or a square. Square works too. Okay. Got a big ass rectangle. Good. Good, good, good. All right. So now I do need to cut off a bit. Uh, that is square. So I've got 10 inches tall, so I'm actually going to cut it off at 10 inches wide. I'm going to split it, um, which will be here. So if I'm going to go ahead and... Is that right? Hang on. What am I doing? What am I... No! Ah, I'm going to cut it on the diagonal there. See? This is because I have to say things out loud. I've done this a million times, but I've never described it to someone while I'm doing it. So I'm going to cut off a square, a 45 degree diagonal. Um, and my, yes, my machine actually, the cutting mat actually has that marked on it. So I can actually just use the line on the cutting mat. That's convenient, 45 degree line, which is right there, which is... It's nine inches high, not 10. See, I was about to mess this up and because I'm talking you through it, I caught it. So I'm cutting off the corner at a 45 degree angle. Cool. And you'll see why I've done that. So as you can see there, I've cut off a corner, I've separated off. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, we're making a parallelogram is what we're doing. I'm gonna take that corner and move it to the other end. So you see here, we're going to reassemble into a parallelogram. And the idea is I'm going to eventually be cutting strips that run across this way that will be on the bias on 45 degrees. But we're going to make a really cool sort of Mobius strip looking thing, which means we're going to get continuous bias binding. So I'm not going to have to sew together, you know, 18 different little strips because that would take all day. I'm actually going to do it in one step, which is much more fun. So the first thing to do is to actually join this parallelogram up. So I'm going to go right side to right side and back to the sewing machine now. And 
and I'm going to sew this together. And I just had a message on my phone, I think from my dad. <laughs> yeah, my dad knows we're cooking goose for Christmas and he's telling me that there's about 50 of them on his lake. <laughs> All right, sewing machine is back on. And I'll be sewing this. I'll be doing a, a, a one quarter inch. It doesn't really matter on your seam allowance here. I'm doing a scant one quarter inch um, just cause I don't wanna, you know, lose any extra fabric. But I'm, yeah, I'm gonna do like a one quarter inch seam. This is a really neat trick. I think I learned it off the Colette website. Actually, Colette is another uh, sewing pattern range that I've made quite a few of their patterns, but um, yeah, continuous binding, bind, bias binding. Um, all right, so we've, we've sewn that little seam together. So we've now got our parallelogram. And so I'm gonna, of course, what's the next step? Iron, we always iron after we sew a seam. I'll trim my ends. Go back to the iron, which is still hot. And I like to iron this little, look, it's a tiny seam that we've just made, but I like to iron it open. So I'm gonna try and open it up, iron it flat. So I'm just ironing that tiny little seam open. And you'll see why soon, as best you can. Okay. So now we need to decide how wide our bias binding is going to be. Um, now, I think I have a bias binding maker. So let me just dig that out and show it to you. They come in different sizes. And it looks like there's various sizes. This is a very small one. So this is a... Uh, that's a bias binding maker. And so you can see it's a, it's a folded bit of metal, like a tube, and you feed the fabric in that end and it sort of folds it into a U shape. It's a lot faster than folding it and burning your fingers and doing it yourself. I have a bigger one, which is the size that I want to use for this. Um, where is it? I really need to organize this box. Is that it? That's, that's a bigger one. Is that the big? No, that's the one I want, the yellow one. So the yellow one is the biggest one. I've got a few different sizes. Um, so the yellow one is a Clover, Clover 12, it says. And basically, which one can you see it better at? Yeah, so it is a, you feed in the fabric in that side and it folds. By the time it comes out the end, it's folded into a little channel. And so it will end up being half an inch wide, and since it's full, I, then I think that means I need to cut it one inch wide because yes, it folds the two sides in a quarter of an inch. So I need to draw lines on this um, parallelogram that are one inch apart. And so I'm gonna yield back to using my white pencil for that. You need something you can see. And I'm gonna be using my clear ruler. And so all I'm gonna do is line that up with the edge because we know that's parallel. And I'm just gonna, just gonna draw lines. And hang on, do I wanna draw these on the front or the back? I think I wanna draw these on the back. Yes, on the back side. That makes more sense. Let me start at the far end, okay. All right, making one inch lines all the way along. So if you're using a dark fabric, you will need to get some sort of a marking implement that you can see. I have not had a lot of luck with the white pencils. 
Um, there are those disappearing ink pens. Those work pretty much the best. But this, this one's not too bad, this particular sort of chalk. I guess it's like a chalk, sort of a waxy colored pencil, I guess. I can see it against the blue, but just kind of just. So I'm just making one inch parallel lines all down this rectangle. Geometry. How exciting. I saw a TikTok that used a couple of pins on padding. Yeah, you could do that as well. Um, yeah, I, I think if you've got, look, gadgets, sewers and, and craft, sewists and craft people, we love our gadgets. And so the little bias tape makers are fun. Uh, you'll see how I use it. It's, it's just, I, I tend, look, I, still, I will still burn myself. I guarantee you I'll burn myself on the iron. Um, but it's always fun to have the right, you know, the right tool for a job. Doesn't mean you can't improvise. Um, you don't have to have them, but uh, there's certainly, if you're making bias tape, um, if you're going to be doing it regularly, and now that I've figured out how to do it, I really enjoy doing it, and I like the effect. It's worth having. So I'm just going... So I guess, you know, the traditional way of doing this is you would cut along these lines and painstakingly sew all these strips together, we are going to do that in a very cool, magical way that is going to save us heaps of effort. But this is like some flatland stuff here, you know, level of geometry, so um, you will see the magic. And I do have on my YouTube, by the way, I think I actually have a video of making continuous bias binding, so there is a separate video on my YouTube I made some time ago. Um, I was using it to trim some, I think, shorts, and so I, uh, I made quite a bit of it, and I made, I think I recorded myself making it. All right, I'm past the halfway mark. A tassel twister. What in the world is a tassel twister? Uh, is, oh, is that like where you twist the cord up on itself to make it make it into like a oh is it like that like for finishing a cushion or something? And where I go across the seam, I'm just going straight across it. Just pay the seam, no mind. I have seen a method of, you know, making twisted cord where you use a power drill. Is it like that, Wobin? It's exactly that. It's three alligator clips attached to a handle. You can like, you know what that is? That is, um, what was it called? There was a Barbie. There was a Barbie that came with a device like that. And uh, Curly Twirls Barbie or something like that. I had it when I was like eight years old. And you could, you know, you could do it on her hair and you could do it on your hair. But yeah, you clip three sections together and then they independently twist and twist around each other. It's, um, yeah, Curly Twirls Barbie. I think, I think it was called something like that. I had no idea you could buy one for craft purposes. That's pretty cool. I guess one question I have, well, when I'm asking you questions while you're here, um, about weaving. It's like, because when I told my husband I was interested in weaving, you know, his question was, oh, what would you make? And I thought, well, I'd make some tea towels and table runners, which are flat rectangular things and scarves. But what else can you make? What else can you make with weaving? I mean, I suppose I could weave fabric and then sew something with it, but like, you know, whole, like, like, tapestries I guess and like decorative pieces but I guess when I've seen weaving it's mainly art pieces it's not necessarily so much like garments okay and so the last one I'm actually going to just cut off because because of the seam allowance for the um 
There you go. I'm just going to cut that part off because I, I, it's not quite an inch wide because I don't cut my arm. Because I lost a little bit on the seam allowance, I'm just going to cut that one off. All right. So we now have a parallelogram with one inch lines all the way along it at 45 degree angles. I'm now going to sew this sucker into a tube. And this is where it's going to get complicated. And you're not going to understand what I'm doing, which is why I will tweet out the link. But again, look up a tutorial for continuous bias binding because it's kind of the thing you need to do yourself to understand. So imagine now I'm going to roll this up into a tube, essentially. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So now I gotta get my geometry working together. Right, so it's gonna go into a tube. And so I'm gonna sew, yeah, a spiral, really a spiral tube. And so I'm gonna sew, I'm gonna match up the lines. So see, if I fold it like this, you can see the lines start to match up. So if I hold it up. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see that. So my lines are matching up but I actually want to offset it by one because if I sew it so that the lines line up and then I cut along the lines, I'll end up with rings. My goal here is not rings. My goal is a continuous spiral. So I'm actually going to shift it one. So I'm going to shift it one row so that I am uh, lining the seams up And, and I'm just going to do it because it's really complicated to explain and it's the kind of 3D geometry you just need to, uh, to do. And so I'm just going to use my pins and make sure. So I'm lining the first line up with the second line at a one quarter inch seam allowance. And who's messaging me? Still my dad? Oh no! My husband telling me our vegetable box hasn't come yet. No, we, well, we don't need it. But yeah, we were kind of hoping for some vegetables. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be awkward. And so I'm just going to now start pinning along this edge and I'm going to be pinning um, on those on those lines I created, but like I said, rather than lining up one to one, I've offset it by one, and that makes no sense until you've actually got it in your hands and you've done the first one. But so Wilbin says that's a lot of what you can do. I've yet to move away from those, but you can with the right setup weave double wide cloth. So you could weave cloth that you could then sew and make something out of. Um, and I'm not saying like yeah, I mean art pieces are lovely too not not a problem but uh there's a guy uh, i know back home in indiana who, who who weaves and does yeah he, he makes like tea towels and stuff and i think he sells them online um and sure that would be fun but i can imagine i will hit a point where i've gifted everyone i know tea towels Just, so I'm now going along and I'm making, I'm making a tube. I am making a spiral tube, but it is some complicated geometry that you really have to have to have in your hands to appreciate. First time I did this, it, it broke my brain a little bit. So I guess the question is if I'm going to use bias binding on the Liberty fabric, but the reason I'm doing that is because I'm, you know, don't have a lot of fabric, I will probably not make my own bias binding from that. It depends on how big a scraps I have, if I have any decent sized scraps. Um, otherwise, I will try and find some bias binding in my stash that is a similarish color um, because, you know, you, you might see a little bit of it. But, yeah, it, <laughs> given that the problem is that I don't have enough fabric, I may not have enough fabric to actually make the bias binding either. 
So I'm just matching them up and I'm trying to match them up at like the one quarter inch seam allowance line really because you know they actually cross at that point when you're pinning them and again none of this makes sense unless you're actually holding it in your hands but trust me pinning this weird shape together and then I'll have to sew this weird ass shape together Okay, that's the last bit. And you gotta be careful because as I said, you cut it on the bias and so it does want to stretch. All right, so I've got, as you can see here, I've got a tube. I've got a tube where it's pinned in a spiral. And so I'm gonna sew that, I'm gonna sew that spiral. I've been considering what she's, what's Will been saying. I've been considering stuff like baby wraps and thin con. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah, I guess you could do that. All right, time to time to sew this weird weird seam. Okay, start at the top, and just be careful not to sew over itself because it is sort of curled up. And I should just put one more pin at the very top there. Okay. And again, I'm gonna use a quarter inch seam on this. And it's gonna be awkward, but you just kind of go a little bit at a time and just make sure you're not running over, like the tube isn't twisted up under the foot and you're not running over the tube itself, just sewing along the edge of it. Just keep every few inches manipulating it to make sure it's not folded up in any way under the, under the foot because it will twist, you know, you are sewing in a twist as you go. So you just keep moving a bit at a time. do have right sides together, that's correct. <laughs> it's always good to make sure. Oh, my back is killing me. Okay, nearly at the end. And then you get to see the magic when I cut this thing apart. Okay, last little bit. Okay, I have sewn my really weird spiral tube together, right? And you can see it's got the lines drawn on it. If I hold it up, you can see those lines on it. So what I'm gonna do now is of course, give it an iron. Um, and I'm gonna use a special tool for this. I have a, a, a sleeve roll. So just give me a second and I'll grab that.
So this here is what's known as a, I think it's called a sleeve roll. I, I mentioned the Taylor's ham before. This, you often buy them as a, as a two, as a kit of two. Um, but this is a sleeve roll and it's for ironing the sleeve of a shirt. Um, it's got, usually they come with two sides. So there is a, a, a white side, which is for ironing like a cotton fabric against because it gets, you know, hotter or flex the heat. Um, and then there's usually a wool side for if you're doing tailoring on, on something wool. So what I'm gonna do, actually first I will iron it flat. I will iron this to set the seam. So I'm just gonna iron along that seam that I just sewed, which is a spiral, you'll recall. So I gotta kinda do a bit at a time and twist it as I go. And then, so that kind of sets the stitches. And then I'm gonna put my sleeve, put it on my sleeve roll, and I'm gonna iron that, um, that seam open. So I'm gonna open it up and iron that seam open. So I'm just sliding it onto the sleeve roll. There we go. And I'm just gonna open that seam up and iron it. Again, you could iron it to one side, but I'm opening it up because it just reduces the bulk a little bit. Because remember, we're gonna be using this to go around the neck of my jumper, or my top. I'm just gonna keep twisting it as I go. Just keep ironing that open. And I'm using the white side because I'm using a cotton and so it will get a bit hotter and reflect the heat more so than the wool side. But you could use a wolf, heck, you could use a folded up towel for this or you could do it by ironing it flat. It's not the end of the world if you are just ironing it flat on your ironing board. Like I said, it's nice if you have the right, the right equipment. And there will be one spot where your two seams intersect, um, you know, the parallelogram seam and the one you've just sewn. And so I said, by opening it up, we're gonna try and reduce the bulk there as much as possible. But you're wondering how the heck I'm gonna use a tube to finish the neckline of my shirt, right? And we're just about ready for the magic. Just about ready for the magic. Okay. All right, so I've ironed that seam down all the way around. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut. Get it back over here. I'm gonna take my scissors hold this up and start at this end. So you can see there's a bit of an offset there and there's the first of the white lines and I'm just gonna start cutting along that white line. And we are gonna end up with a continuous one inch strip of bias bond. I'm gonna put it on my arm actually, that will make it easier because I don't cut my fingers. And so I'm just now cutting along that strip those, those lines that I drew, the one inch lines. Probably hard for you to see, they're quite faint even for me. And when I get done, I'm just gonna cut across the seam. And if I did a good job pinning, they should line up in a continuous spiral. And you see, I'm gonna end up with meters of this stuff, way more than I need. But like I said, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna go to the work of doing it, make more than you need because then you've got it for another project in the future. This is gonna be heaps more than I actually need. But this is the magical bit. This is where you're just getting 
strips and strips of perfect 45 degree matching bias binding to finish your project. So then if you don't have one of the fancy tools like I do, you just fold it and iron it. You fold it in half and fold it in half again. That's normally the way you do it, but I'm going to use the little tool here in a second along with the iron, which is a little bit more, again, it's more fun. These are the good scissors, by the way. These are not the scissors that I cut the pattern out with. Not the paper scissors, these are the good scissors. So mine are Soft Canaries, that's a Japanese brand of scissors. I bought these back in Sydney. Um, they're nice and sharp. So for anyone just joining, my, I've sewn the front and back of the shirt together. So to recap, huh, all day, because I've been going all day on this. First thing I did was print out the PDF pattern. So this is the uh, ruffle sleeve top from the designer In The Folds. It is a free pattern available on Peppermint Magazine online, if you look it up. And uh, so I, I, I printed out the pattern. I assembled the pattern all together with a glue stick and with some tape. Um, then I did a full bust adjustment on the paper pattern uh, because it was drafted for a B cup and my full bust size was an inch and a half bigger than what it specified. So did a full bust adjustment, which you can go back and watch in the first stream. Then it was time to actually cut out the fabric, which we've done. Um, this pattern does come with facings, which are sort of almost like a lining that gets sewn on and folded to the inside and it hides a lot of unfinished seam edges and um, it gives a very professional finish. I, I am making this shirt twice. This first one, the blue one, is a practice run because in my real fabric, the pink fabric, I don't have very much. I don't think I have enough to do the facings. So I'm planning on finishing the neck with bias binding. Uh, so I'm practicing that on the blue one, which is what I'm doing right now is making continuous bias binding. So I've used some of the fabric. I have squared it up. I have made it into a parallelogram. I've drawn one inch parallel lines. I've sewn this weird spiral geometrical, you know, tesseract together. <laughs> and now I'm cutting it into a very long strip of continuous bias binding. Much nicer than the old-fashioned way of sewing lots of strips together. This you only sew one, well, two seams really. And we're down to the very last one. Done. Heaps. Heaps of bias binding. Cool. All right, now we're going to use our really cool little tool to actually fold this up. Right back to my ironing board. And so what I'm going to do, I don't need the sleeve roll anymore, is I'm going to use a pin and I'm actually going to pin um, the end. That's what I'm going to do, pin the end. So find the end here, end of the bias binding. I'm going to feed it, first thing I'm going to do is feed it into the bias binding maker. And that's actually the trickiest part is um, getting it through. So you start at the big end and you want to feed it in and it's going it, to, it's a sort of a C shape. And so basically if you turn it over, there's a channel. And so I can use a pin to kind of force the fabric along until it starts coming out the end. And what it will do is it will come out the end and it's gonna be folded at the far tip. So I've pulled it out and then what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to, oops, running out of head, headphone space here. Uh, I'm gonna pin that, that end onto my ironing board. Um, 
There's another pin. So I've pinned that and now I can actually just pull it, pull the tool along the ironing board and put my iron right in front of it and iron it. And it's, so it's folding it and I'm ironing it at the same time. And so it means it's not burning the crap out of my skin the way it does if you try and fold it normally. Now as you come up to seams, so here I've got a, a seam, I'm just going to press it. So I'm just trying to keep it as flat as possible and it should just feed in just like the rest. But you just want to be a little careful when you go over the seams to not bunch them up too much. And this can be a good time to put steam on your iron if you've got it because you want to really set those folds. And you're just going to do this for the entire length, which means I'm going to have to move the pins periodically. Yep, so there we go. Meters of the stuff. Okay, I've repinned it, and now I'll just keep going. Just pull it along. Coming up to another seam, so I'll iron the seam flat. Yeah, you just want to make sure to see the seam is wanting to catch. It doesn't want to go in properly. Oh, it's because it's got a little fold. Iron it flat. Get in there. You there we go. And yes, fingertips do get hot. You are gonna you do need to have Teflon fingers to a small extent here. Is the um the tool does get a little hot as well, especially when you're bumping it up against the iron as I am. So the other problem I have with some of the store-bought bias binding is it's like polycotton, like polyester, and it will melt <laughs> if you use too high a heat on it. So that's why making your own to match the fabric, I think is always a better way to go if you can. Okay, time to move again. And the pins just sort of hold it so that you can pull the tool along. Probably, oh, it's hot. I probably should have put some water in my iron to get some steam going. It would help set the uh, set the folds a little more. But yeah, you just have to make sure that the width of your strips is right for a your project and b if you are using a tool, you want to make sure they're the right size for the tool. So I knew since this was a half, the opening is half an inch. You double that, and so it's a one inch. This is a one inch strip. It does want to unfold a bit where the where the seams are at right angles to each other, but it's okay. Move the strip along again. Obviously, if I were using the full length of the ironing board, I wouldn't have to move it so frequently, but I've got my other fabric on it. Iron the seams again. 
Oh God, why did I make so much? This is taking a take forever. <sighs> And I'm just feeding the seams in as they come. So if anybody's just joining, I am making, I've just cut a whole big long meters and meters of continuous bias binding and I am now ironing using a clover bias binding tool which sort of folds the sides in and then you kind of iron, just iron along as you pull the tool across the fabric. Just saves you some time. I'm just shifting it as I go. And you will periodically, I mean the bigger piece you start with, the, the less frequently you will cross, you'll have seams. So if you start from a bigger, bigger square, you will have less seams. But the beauty of the technique I showed you with the rectangle and with the parallelogram is you can pretty much use any size scrap as long as you can get a, a rectangle out of it or a square. And then to store these, <laughs> I tend to um, wrap them around an old toilet paper tube or a dish towel tube, cardboard tube. Uh, so yeah, I just wrap them around it and then put a, put a pin or a rubber band around it and um, put it in my stash. And so I've got a few that I've made up. It's always good to have a selection. Oof, that tool is getting hot. Mm, isn't it fun? Did you know that 90% of sewing is actually ironing? Because it totally is. I did a video on my YouTube channel of making a Hawaiian shirt for my husband um, a year or two ago. And yeah, it's, it's, it's mostly ironing. Uh, I actually speed up the ironing parts because in real time, as you're working out, it's a little boring. Okay, going over another seam. I can see the end, the end is inside. And then we'll be able to actually attach this to the collar around the neckline of our top, of my top, my top, not your top. So much bias binding. So what did I do? I did like 10 inches by, by, by 23 inches or something like that. And I've ended up with like meters and meters of this stuff. So, you know, it actually, um, this technique, you get quite a bit out of it. So I, if I'm clever when I cut out the pink one, I'll, I would love to use, the, I, would, I mean, I, it's ideal if you can make your own bias binding. It will then match perfectly. But. And just come to a part where there's two seams and so it's a little, it doesn't want to quite go in, it's a bit thick there. Just 
gonna re-iron that spot. It's where I've got, it's the one spot where I've got my two seams intersecting each other. It doesn't quite wanna fit into the machine. There we go. There we go, you just gotta give it a little bit of a pull. And I'll honestly probably not use that bit when I actually come to use this, like I would cut around that bit because that bit is a little extra thick. But it's kind of unavoidable. Unless you want to sew 57 fiddly little strips together, as I said. Okay, we are off the floor, nearly done. Only, only slightly burning my fingertips now. The ironing board and the iron and the tool are quite hot. This is like slow TV. <laughs> You're watching me. Iron bias binding in real time. Here we go. And kind of push it along with the iron and not have to touch it with my hands. Because that fabric is hot. Okay, I think this will be the last Last bit. See, when I make the YouTube videos, I fast forward through these parts. So if you missed this morning's stream and you want to see the riveting part where I assembled the pattern and did the full bust adjustment, um, it is available on Twitch. I think they stay up on Twitch for two weeks and then I am archiving them to my YouTube channel. Um, so you can see them on there as well. And oh my gosh, finally the end, finally the end. Yeah, if you want to go back and watch the morning's part so you can see the whole shirt <laughs> start to finish, feel free. Put it on in the background while you have your Christmas dinner. Hang on. That one's... Sometimes the seam wants to like fold up. I'm just going to trim that one a little bit. Okay. Almost. Quite a long digression to make our bias binding, but trust me, the results are going to be worth it. And we're just at the last couple inches. All right, tool is off. That means we've gotten to the end. Oh my gosh, so much bias binding. So we've basically, we've, we've ironed a, a fold into that. Woo! <sighs> I'm tired now. Oh, Woban is headed to bed. Thanks Woban, have a lovely Christmas, you too. Thanks for hanging around so long today. Oh, 
thirsty. Okay. Let's actually apply this now. All right. We need our, our shirt, which is still sitting here on the ironing board. Time to uh, attach the shirt, the, the, the bias binding to the shirt. This is normally where we'd be putting the facing on. I'm not using a facing. I'm using self-made bias binding. So I'm actually going to do this on, turn on the right side or the wrong side? Let me just do a quick check before I do this the wrong way. How to sew bias binding. So do I want it to show or not show? I want it to not show. Um, Right, you start on the outside, you start on the outside. So neckline, all right, let's get our top. So there's our top, right? And so we're gonna sew along that neckline. And we have a V-neck, which is gonna be interesting. Ah, that's where the trick is going to be. Bias binding V-neck. That's gonna be the trick, because I think I start and stop at the V, don't I? How to apply bias binding as a facing to a V-neck. All right, so this is a tutorial I'm looking at. Um, yep. Oh, I like this finish. This is gonna be nice. Okay, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. Okay, she does this. This is this is uh, wendyward.wordpress.com is the tutorial I'm doing. Um, and so she does tacking first, actually tacking to make it super accurate. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to start and stop applying this at the V. And I want that point at the V to be uh, super, super precise. So let me just update. I am attaching bias binding. Okay. There we go. So she has me attach it and I'm gonna use some, use some like yellow thread so I can see it. See the tacking that I'm doing. I'm just gonna cut a big long piece of this. And And I need a sewing needle. <coughs> Excuse me. I have one here, it's a fairly big one, but that's okay. Um, Cause this is just sort of like a, I'm just tacking it in place and I don't think I have a smaller one handy. That one will do. I'm gonna thread that. Okay. And so I'm looking at the right side of the garment and I'm gonna get, where's the end? Find the end of this stuff. There's the end. And I'm going to overlap it. Um, so I'm gonna extend it a bit beyond the point. And then I'm going to right at the point of the V, I'm gonna need to mark that point. 
That's what I want to do because I want to make sure that my two ends overlap at exactly the center. So I'm just going to use my, my trusty pen. And I need just a quarter of an inch, right? This is going to be a quarter of an inch, which is it's pretty much there. It's exactly where I've sewn the two, the two lines of stay stitching. So I'm actually going to use that point. So I'm actually going to start right there. Yep. And yes, we're doing a little bit of hand sewing here. And so I'm going to take like a back stitch at that point because this is the point where both of these need to meet perfectly both ends of the thing so it's very important that I've got I'll make a knot in the end there as well Ah, can I make two knots in the same spot? Apparently not. Okay, that'll do, that'll do. Let's make a knot, we made a knot. Okay, and now I'm gonna just baste this along the opening, but I've got that point, which is the exact center point. And so I've made a nice back stitch there so I can really see it. And that is the point of which I'm gonna try and make everything line up perfectly. All right, so now I'm just gonna sew it around the neckline. Eh, why is it all tangled up? All tangled up, because I've got meters and meters of it. I'm just gonna use like a running stitch. So this is why I'm doing a practice garment so I can practice this. And so I'm using the fold that I just ironed in. I'm sewing along that fold because that is one quarter inch with my handy handy little tool. And because this is bias binding, it will just easily stretch around the curve. Um, Whereas a normal square cut strip will not want to bend around the curve of the neckline. And this cheap thread. This is like, I, I think I bought this thread at Ikea. So I really only use it for like craft projects. So again, this stitching is just temporary. We're not going to see it. I'm actually gonna sew just on the inside of the fold because when I sew, I'm gonna sew along that line. So you could just pin it, pin it really good, but uh, the tutorial I'm looking at, she suggests hand tacking it in place. So that is what I'm doing. This is tacking or basting. So we're just taking some fairly big, some fairly big stitches and I'm just running it along the edge of that fold there. And again, if I were doing a facing, I would have cut, um, basically they have separate pattern pieces 
that sort of are basically the same size and shape as the front and back of the garment, but they don't go all the way down to the bottom. They're just sort of um, just the sort of top half. And so they get sewn together, similar to how you sewed together the front and back, and they get sewn on around the neck and shoulders and it gets folded to the inside. So it's, it's like a little half lining. That's called a facing. Um, but I am not doing the facings. I am just doing bias binding. And the idea of this is we're just trapping that raw edge. We're giving it a nice finish. And we use bias binding because it stretches around the curves. Because a neckline on a human being is a curve. Unless you're doing some weird, some weird boat neck. Okay, I'm at the shoulder now, so I'm just gonna make sure that when I do my tacking, remember my shoulder seam is, we ironed it open. So I'll just make sure when I tack it down that I'm, that I'm catching the seam allowance open. Oh, this thread really wants to catch and knot up on itself. And it's knotted. And it broke. All right, it's not the end of the world. We're just tacking it. So you know what I will do? I will just cut that there and make a new knot and continue from where I am because this thread sucks. Make a quick and dirty knot and continue onwards. All right, so this is where we're at the shoulder seam. So it's really where the curve is the most extreme. turn and go across the back of the neck. So normally with a round neckline with bias binding, you start and finish just on the back side so that the, the join is, is kind of hidden on the back side uh, of the person. But because I have a V-neck, um, I, I, uh, you can't make a sharp point like that. And so to, to, to account for the point of the V-neck, I'm actually starting and stopping at the V of the V-neck. So slightly different, that's slightly different procedure for this than, than you would otherwise. So again, just tacking, just tacking around the neckline. I don't know that I'm gonna finish this shirt today. I think it might have to be a finish tomorrow kind of a thing because it's Christmas Eve and someone is cooking me a goose.
Okay, I'm almost around to the other shoulder. This is why whenever movies have a scene of people making clothes, it's a montage <laughs> because it takes a long time and has a lot of ironing and a lot of boring stuff. So. Back around to the other shoulder. I'm sewing over the shoulder seam now, and then we turn and go back down the other side of the v-neck, and we'll be joining the v's together. Again, I'm making sure that that shoulder seam is open. When I've tacked down, I've tacked over the seam open. I ironed it open as well. I say we like you've done any of this. I did it all. <laughs> okay. And there's a bit, we've gotten to a bit with a seam, but that's totally fine. I'm just gonna tack it open as we go. Okay, I'm getting back to the point of the V now. Go back to my little tutorial and just make sure. So make sure that both of them Starting it. Oh, okay. So what she suggested is I actually this first bit I'm going to pin back on itself so that I can make sure that that they both start and end at the exact same point. Yep, there it is. Let's pin that. Because I really want these two bits of bias binding to meet at exactly one point in the in the middle. Um, so my tacking should start and stop in exactly the same point of the V on the other side, which it will. So that's, that's the bit I'm doing right now. So the V last, last little bit to get to the V. And again, this tutorial is on Wendy Ward, W-E-N-D-Y-W-A-R-D dot wordpress.com. And it's, uh, it's entitled how to apply bias or attaching bias binding as a facing to a V-neck. And it's an excerpt from a project that Wendy did. I think I've done this in the past, but I wasn't happy with the finish. So we'll see if Wendy's method, if, if taking the time to do this hand tacking actually makes a difference. All right, so I'm getting to the end here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut off, and I'll leave an extra inch or two of the bias binding, but I'm gonna cut it off and we're done. We don't need all of that. But I wanna make sure that this bias binding starts and ends in exactly the same point as the other piece, which is 
there. Yes. Just sort of do an extra stitch at the end to sort of tack it all in place. Which is there, that's that's the spot. Okay. Okay. Done with the hand sewing. Blurg. All right, now we can machine sew this in place. Back to the machine. Okay. So machine in place. Okay. All right. Making sure I understand what I'm doing. Uh, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I took the pin out. Mm. To just undo a bit of this left hand edge. There, and then I will kind of fold it out of the way so I start and stop at the exact same point on each one, right? Right. And so do I kind of fold them out of the way? Trying to see in the photos on this blog post exactly how it's done. Let's zoom in. Yeah, you just start and stop at that exact point. Okay. All right, that's, that's gonna be the tricky bit. Okay. So right at that exact point is where I start and stop on both sides. So, Time to actually sew, machine sew this. This is where I need to be very careful to get the needle down in exactly the right position. So I'll use my Yeah, okay. Okay. We appear to be down, we appear to be ready to sew. So I'm gonna be sewing this. I'm gonna sew, I'm attaching the bias binding now and I'm sewing just on the inside of my tacking line. One, two, three, now back up. Okay. Slow and steady. And just make sure I'm not running over my garment at any stage. So the tacking keeps everything nice and neat. Okay. Coming around towards the shoulder. Just watch that knot that we made before where the thread broke. 
and make sure that as I come up to the shoulder seam, it is going through open. So I'll lift my presser foot and make sure it's, it's actually folded open under there. Nice and slow. This is, as I said, this is kind of an extreme curve where the shoulder meets. Just gently rearrange things. And look, I'm sewing over a bit of my tacking line. That's fine. I'll still be able to undo it. I can unpick it if any of it tries, dares to show through. It shouldn't do, though. Okay, going nearly back around to the other shoulder. Stitching was a bit uneven through here. That's all right. And my shoulder seam is open. I'm going back down the other side of the v-neck now. Back around to the beginning. And this is where I need to literally get it so that it ends in the exact same spot where the other one started. Here we are back at the point. So this is where I just need to go really slowly and take my time and make sure it goes at the exact same point. One more stitch. Okay, right there we go. And then I'm gonna go back one, two, three and forward. Okay, cut it. We have attached our bias binding on the front. All right, tutorial says. Snip into the seam allowance as close as you dare on the front of the garment. Um, yeah, so at the point of the V, I actually do wanna cut in a tiny bit, just make a tiny notch as much as you dare. <laughs> okay, tiny notch made. Now let it fold back on itself to cover your stitching and fold it around completely to the back side. So. So we're now gonna be turning the bias binding to the inside and folding it on itself. Um, and so we can actually pin it and we can iron it as well. So I'm gonna just start doing that. I'm gonna be folding it around and then folding it on that seam line so that it encloses the raw edge and folds to the inside. And I'll go around and I'll leave the points for the moment. Uh, so many threads to trim. Okay. So the, you're not gonna see it on the outside of the garment. We're gonna kind of, we're rolling it to the inside and because it's got that extra fold, it's completely enclosing the raw edges inside. So that's where you get this neat finish with the bias binding. 
because we've captured all the raw edges and they can't fray and they can't poke through and it looks really nice and tidy on the inside. And you can't actually see any of my yellow stitching, so I'm not even gonna bother. Do I bother pulling it out? Oh, I can, maybe I will, just in case. One of those knots. Yeah, no, the one that's got the knot in it, I'll pull that out. Might as well get rid of it and get rid of any risk that it shows through. I did sew over it in a couple places. It's pulling out easily enough. Okay. I'm just continuing around pinning the bias binding in place. such a stickler about threads poking through. I like to keep all the thread ends tidy. And because it's biased, it just moves around the curves. And even with the fold, it goes around the curves so nicely. You don't have to stretch it. It's not sort of making any ripples in place. It's just lying nice and flat, which is the goal. I never manage to get it fully flat, to be honest with you. I always end up with a slightly ripply neckline, but you know, stay stitching helps. But I think it's just something that comes with experience and practice. Mine never quite lays perfectly flat. All right, so as we get down, turn the whole thing inside out while I'm doing this. So as we get down to the ends, to the V, wrap one end of the binding around the other. I'm looking at the pictures as I go. Okay, there's my two ends. Get rid of some more of that yellow thread so it doesn't show.
Okay, I've got two pieces of bias lying. Okay, I, now mine looks like hers. That's good. It's always good when it looks like the picture. And wrap one end of the binding around the other. Okay, I can do that. Let's trim the binding off even first. Okay, and then this one we cut off a little shorter. I see. I see what we're doing. We're going to kind of make a neat little package. Yay, like that. I wish I wish I had a better setup so you could see what I'm doing. But I've made a nice nice little mitered corner on the inside. And I'm just going to pin that. And all the raw ends are captured there. Okay, machine in place from the right side following your tagging. Okay, but this is where we had to sew on the right side and I've just put all my pins on the wrong side. Well, I'm gonna do it anyway. Okay. Am I going to flip my pins around to the outside? I think I probably will. You know, just to be... Ouch. So this is where I start sticking myself. I always suck at doing this, sewing it from the outside and making sure I catch the inside properly. So if I just be careful where I put the pins and use that as my sewing line. Make sure the pin is going through the edge, which it is. And then make sure I'm sewing along the line where the pins go. I should be okay. No idea if anybody's even watching at this point. <laughs> this is one person. That might actually be me. I'm not sure. Um, but whoever you are, I am, I am pinning bias binding around the neckline of the ruffle sleeve top by in the folds. The original pattern has a facing, which is like a lining but I have opted not to do that. I'm doing a bias binding finish around the neck instead, which is just a thin strip of bias fabric, which is fabric that's cut on the 45 degrees, which we just spent like an hour making. Um, but because of that, it stretches around curves really nicely. And so I have used that around this V-neck and I am now Making sure getting, I'm going to sew it on the right side, and so I'm just moving my pins actually to the right side of the fabric. And I'm going to make sure I've got that point right at the point of the V looking really nice. Probably 
give that a bit of a press at the point of the V as well, just because I want it to be as nice as possible. Your eye is going to be drawn right there in the middle of the front. So you really want, this is why I'm going all this effort and using the special technique to do the bias binding in the V. Because if you stuff it up, you're going to see it. I'm just transferring all my pins to the right side because I'm actually going to sew this bias binding on the right side. And that's it. That's where all the way back around again. Yep. I use lots of pins when I do this because, as I said, it always tends, I never tend to get it to sit perfectly flat. But all right. Time to sew this down. And I think then I'm going to call it a night. And I'll do the sleeves tomorrow because uh, this is not a fast process. Oh, let me just quickly iron the point of the V just a little bit. Um, just use the iron and make sure that the point of the V is nice and flat before I sew it. And I'm going to start and stop at the back of the neck, actually, because that way you won't see where I'm starting and stopping. And I'm going to be sewing in a quarter inch, needle down. Okay, time to sew around the bias binding. And this is where I'm going to take my time and make sure I'm catching it where, the fold, where it's folded under. Do a couple stitches, backtrack. Okay, here we go. Not too fast, self. around these curves. A little thread peeking out there. I'm just going to trim it. So the effect on the outside of the garment is just a line of stitching. That's, that's all that you're going to see. Um, because it's the same color and it's folded to the inside. You might see a little bit of a fold line, but because it's, you know, and we could have, I could have done some understitching into the seam allowance um, to try and force it to roll more to the inside, but I'm not gonna bother really. It's the same color, so you're not really gonna notice it. If I were using a different color bias binding, like a decorative bias binding, I may have tried harder to make sure you wouldn't see any, any scrap of it whatsoever. But because we went to the trouble of making the same color, the same fabric, we should be fine. Okay, I'm coming around to the point of the V. So this is, this is where I need to just be very precise. I'm basically gonna get to the middle stitch and I'm gonna stop and actually pivot. Okay, just coming up to the point of the V now. And I am going to sew over the pin this time, but I'm going stitch by stitch. Okay, I'm at the point. I'm now going to pivot. Pivot. <laughs> I'm pivoting. Foot goes back. Maybe I wanted to go one more stitch. Maybe I'll go one more stitch before I pivot. 
I'll just manually go one more. Okay. And now I'll pivot. And now I can pull that pin out. And I think we're good. I guess I'll, I'll only know for sure once I pull it off. But, okay, now I'm going back up the other side of the v-neck. Looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. It's all about that V. I need like a GoPro mounted on my head so you can actually see what I see when I'm doing this be a lot more interesting for you. Okay, coming up to the shoulder. I'm nearly back around to where I started. So I'm almost done. Just make sure everything is lining up hunky dory. This might be my best bias binding ever. So I'm actually taking my time and talking you guys through it and therefore I'm not rushing as much as I normally do and I haven't ended up with any ripply bits or bubbles as far as I can tell in there. I'm back at the beginning. So again, just do a little back stitch to finish it off. And, and we have attached our bias binding at the neckline and holy crap, that looks pretty good at the V. That looks pretty good. I'll give it a nice press right now. Um, I'll just give it a good iron. That looks really nice, you guys. This could be one of my better bias binding attachings. And let me just look on the inside and see, did I catch, did I catch it all the way around? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I think I did, you guys. Uh, I could do a, you know what, I might do a little extra hand stitching on the bias binding on the point on the inside. Um, I didn't quite catch where it folded under, but I can do it with some hand sewing. But more importantly, from the outside, from the outside, it actually looks great. And you know what? I'm just gonna step aside and try this on really quickly. So give me one second and you can actually, I will actually try it on. Be right back. So far, so good. Look, I have a V-neck blouse, okay? The neckline is finished. However, the sleeves are unfinished. Remember, we've done some stay stitching there, but that's where we'll be, uh, tomorrow we'll be attaching the sleeves with the giant ruffle. So I'm very excited to see how that goes. So come back tomorrow, we'll be putting in the sleeves and I'll be finishing the hem at the bottom of the garment. And uh, hopefully we'll finish this, the trial run of the ruffle sleeve top. 
and uh, I'll be working on that on Christmas Day. So I hope you have a lovely Christmas Eve. Um, I hope uh, Santa, if you celebrate, brings you everything that you want, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for joining me. Bye.